Right, good morning, everyone. Um, we've still got lots of people joining the webinar, um, but we will start the proceedings uh, in a minute or two. Um, just a few quick notes about the securities. Uh, those of you who've been at the webinar since the beginning will know that we had some difficulties with securities uh, at the beginning of in the first webinar. And so I have tightened up the security quite significantly uh, to try and prevent uh, people who are not welcome from joining our call. Um, I have at the moment switched the chat facility off completely. When Andrew begins his presentation, I will open the chat facility to allow participants to interact with each other and to post questions. But uh, obviously, if we have any problems, um, any challenges, I will shut that off immediately so that we don't have to uh, get any Zoom bombers attacking us like we did in the first webinar. I hope that will be okay with you all, but I will keep chatting with you all in, uh, in the channel, in the chat channel. Please feel free to post questions in the chat channel once we get going. Um, and also please uh, feel free to respond to the chat. We had some really uh, good interactions between participants last webinar, and I'd like to encourage that again. Um, I will also be uh, allowing you to raise your hand if you would like to ask a question, um, because that worked successfully last time, uh, every 10 to 15 minutes or so, Andrew will take a pause and he will invite people to ask a, a few questions. If your hand is raised uh, at that point, I will open up for one or two. Obviously, depending on time, we might not be able to reach everybody. We'll take all the questions, but we'll take as many as we can. Um, and Andrew goes through all the chat afterwards as well to see what the, the issues were and tries to integrate some of those into his uh, next slide deck. So up there, you'll see uh, our sort of webinar rules and etiquette um, for everyone. If you could please adhere to that. Uh, for preference, please keep the video switched off. Um, we are monitoring video to keep the videos switched off because that is another uh, weakness in the Zoom security. But it also just uh, helps to keep the bandwidth load a bit lower. Um, and then uh, for the rest of the issues, uh, we've, we, we've listed them there. If you have any real crises, try and uh, send me an email. But obviously, I'm quite busy with managing the webinar for Andrew. So uh, I can only look at the mail periodically. So what I'm going to do now uh, is hand over to our AAU colleague, not today, um, Naduma Glamini, who unfortunately has a competing appointment. Uh, but her colleague, Violet Makuku, is going to formally welcome us from the AAU side. Um, so uh, over to you, Violet. Violet, you have not unmuted yourself, so you're going to need to unmute your microphone. There you go. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Secretary General of the Association of African Universities, Professor Etienne Ehile, I want to welcome you all uh, to this um, uh, part of uh, the webinar series which we were having, and we hope, as usual, uh, I also want to acknowledge the good work that is being done by our partners, Nelly and team. Uh, that is uh, well appreciated. We also noted uh, the good uh, participation and exchange of information, questioning, which makes it highly in taking place. I wish us all the best in this webinar, but uh, I also want to remind you that uh, we are going to have another one on uh, communicating effectively during campus closure. And as usual, we expect you to join us and to make your contributions and to learn from the interaction during that webinar. And uh, a separate uh, one, which is uh, related to quality assurance, will then come on the 7th. So looking forward to that and wishing you well in these deliberations. Thank you all. Thank you, Violet. And uh, over to you, Andrew. All right. Welcome, everyone. 
And here's our team today. I think we've all introduced ourselves. Uh, Neil, by now you know well, he's coordinating all the action in the back room, the back channel. And Kathy is on hand to lend some muscle to make sure that we get through everyone. Um, Violet, we've heard from, and I am your present, uh, your facilitator today. Remember, last time I mentioned a good tip is that when you're doing something online, your the lecturer or the facilitator should have an online presence. So here's mine, uh, more or less the same as last week. If you'd like to go through some of my social media channels, there they are. Grab the PowerPoint, and you can we can interact that way. Uh, as Violet has already pointed out, um, today is the third in a series of four webinars. We've already looked at teaching effectively and what to teach during campus closure. Today's focus is on how to know if learning is happening. How can you monitor that learning is proceeding? And um, we've got another one on the 8th of May, Friday, communicating effectively. So keep those in mind. We're slowly putting our puzzle together. All right, so what are we going to try and do today? So here's our agenda. We want to monitor if learning is actually happening. All the things we used to use as markers to determine whether there's progress happening are beginning to have disappeared in ERT. We don't get those nonverbal um, feelings. We don't get that buzz in the lecture now um, and so on. So how can we monitor that learning is still going ahead? And we've got four ways to tackle this. So we're going to look at some activities that give feedback via the LMS. And we introduced the LMS in the last webinar. We said it's something that you need to now get to grips with. We, the learning management system is very much a, a helpful tool in terms of structuring and getting information about what's happening during ERT. So you're going to have a look at some of the activities that the LMS offers. We're also going to be looking in the second part on assessment. So ERT assessment, how can we exploit digital diagnostic and formative assessment tools? We've separated those out from exams and, and uh, term papers uh, because there's a lot more flexibility and there's quite some nice tools that we can have a look at. In the third section, we're going to look at LMS diagnostic tools and tracking. So here we can uh, get information which allows us to analyze progress and to determine how much um, student headway is being made in terms of your course. And we'll show you some of the tracking tools that are offered in nearly all of the LMSs. And finally, uh, we this was raised in one of the participant feedback sessions in the last webinar. If summative assessment uh, needs to be treated differently when we go into ERT, everything we used to do in the past is very traditional and we now need to rethink how we would do summative assessment uh, during ERT. So we're going to open that can of worms and have a think and hopefully get some feedback from the team. Uh, many of you have already been down this road and it'd be great to hear your experiences. And that is going to be something we're going to encourage throughout the session. We want to know what have been your experiences, both good and bad, so that we can share them as a team. Time permitting, we'll have a look at quizzes, which is one of these formative assessment free platforms that you can use. That's in our tips and tricks section. All right, and there we'll look at how to set them up and uh, how to put some questions in and so on. All right. Also, keep in mind, before we get going in earnest, keep in mind that all the resources you will see, and there's going to be little baskets of OERs like we've done previously. If you want to access them, then there are two places where you can get hold of this presentation and the links. One is our classroom. There's the link to our classroom and the code that you would need, the Google Classroom. Some people have been saying that they couldn't get in, and yet, some people did get in in the last webinar, so it's not a capacity issue. I would say try again, and if you do have a Gmail account, use your Gmail um, uh, login to access the classroom, because we did get people um, registering for the first time uh, last week, so it's working, so try it out. However, if that doesn't work for you, don't panic. We've got um, a, a repository of all the webinar resources on the OER Africa website, 
So use that link, click through, look for which webinar you're interested in, one, two, or three. And you can take the recordings, you can take the presentation, and all the links to the various resources. Okay. So here we go. Let's have a think. What are we trying to do? We are trying to ascertain whether learning is actually happening. That's the focus of this webinar. And one of the things you can do to set this whole in this whole process in motion is to set activities that do give us this type of feedback. So what type of activities do give us information? So um, one of the beauties of the LMS is, of course, that it's a closed environment. I know a lot of people don't like this idea. A lot of academics now are saying we need everything to be open and there's a good place for that. But I think it's quite um, important that you also have a little space which is private where you can hang out your dirty washing and uh, you discuss issues without a big public following. So the LMS is very good at this. And within the LMS, there are usually a, a quiz module or a testing module, and it has the usual suspects. The nice thing about most of these quiz uh, facilities is that they are machine markable, which, okay, they take some time to set up, but then you can more or less leave them alone and students can access the quizzes and tests asynchronously in their own time and then they can go through and the machine will provide them with some type of feedback that you've built into the quiz. Uh, the usual suspects are multiple choice, um, uh, true or false. Uh, we've even got these days drag and drop where you can drag labels onto a diagram, um, uh, for example, or you can uh, drag one picture onto another picture. So that's also quite common. The, um, those type of questions, the normal lot are available and um, we would strongly suggest that you start thinking about how can I have little short tests which provide me with some feedback. Obviously the more creative and, and clever your questions are as to how much information that you can get back as to their progress. We've been championing Google Classroom as a free and personal LMS, in case your institution does not have um, a learner management system. Uh, so Google Classroom 2 has a quiz, um, uh, it's called Questions, a, a quiz section, and uh, it does provide you with some feedback as to uh, the progress uh, of, that the students are going through. Um, but you, um, besides Google Classroom, uh, you've also got lots of little apps. The um, internet now is full of little startups who are all experimenting with different types of quizzes uh, that you can do online. So I've just put in two there, which I know have a free, a free community um, offering. And um, I've got going for Go Formative and Socrative, which um, especially Socrative seems very sophisticated in terms of the data that it gives back to you after a class has worked through some type of a quiz or a test. Okay, so that's like the obvious low hanging fruit. Get in there, start to learn how they work and put together some of uh, these little quizzes. Another thing that's nice about the LMS is that it gives you course completion statistics. So a lot of what I'm talking about uh, come from, comes from my experience with Moodle. I've spent many hours hours and hours and hours inside Moodle. I know it's like the back of my hand. I can make it jump through um, hoops. But to be honest, if you know one L LMS, it doesn't take you very long before you get uh, familiar with uh, any other LMS. So they all offer some type of course completion statistics. Uh, in Moodle, what happens is as the students access various resources or engage with various uh, discussion forums or indulge in a quiz or whatever, the machine, the platform tracks what they've done and um, what their performance was like uh, in any of those markable quizzes. Um, another nice thing, which is interesting in the sense that it uh, encourages 
a different set of markers. Normally faculty gets a little bit overwhelmed during ERT, feeling they have to go through every activity and provide feedback and grading and so on. But the LMSs also encourage the, um, the lecturer to create peer review activities. Uh, in Moodle, it's called the workshop activity. I'm not sure what it is in Blackboard or Sakai um, or Canvas, um, but they all now are beginning to experiment with these peer review activities. So um, the students mark each other's work and that way they get feedback as to their progress. And then you can look at the uh, end results after everything has been processed by the students. So there's another way that you can uh, relieve some of the burden of ha having to go through and monitor every single intervention. Here you can get the peers to do some of it for you. And uh, all of the LMSs, the fact that it's a closed environment and that only authenticated users can go into the LMS means that they leave a, a digital trail all over the place. And the, uh, what you can do then is call for the logs for your course uh, in the LMS and it'll show you which students have done what and how often and when and so on. So there's a whole student activity report module built into these LMSs. So these are like very easy ways to get some indication as to whether learning is happening. And you can see that these are very much um, as a consequence of being in a closed environment whereby students are authenticated when they come in. So therefore we can have very detailed information about their progress. All right, once again, as per the other webinars, we're putting together a little basket of OERs for you. We are OER Africa, obviously our mandate is to encourage academics to use OERs and to release their own materials with an openly licensed, well, a Creative Commons license onto your best resources. So have a think about that. But in the meantime, you can have a look at what other people have already done. Uh, on this particular instance, because it's all about LMSs, I thought uh, little YouTube videos would be probably more useful. There's one there on activity completion. There's one on, on that workshop peer review in Moodle. And there's even one for if you wanna create quizzes in your Google Classroom. Uh, how'd you go about that? So those are all how-to little YouTube videos. All right, I think we should pause, Neil, and let's have a look. What do people think about the role that the LMS and the various types of activities that, that you can build for ERT? Uh, do we have any feedback from other people as to the success of this? Right, well, I've got, uh... I've got one comment in the chat. Good morning, everyone. With regards to a summative assessment, we are currently exploring the use of portfolio of evidence as a summative means to assess learning. What is your opinion on the use of this method and for the purpose? Um, so maybe you can answer that question, Andrew. I also have one hand raised. So when you've answered this question, I will, well, let, let me let me allow, uh, I've got a prof, Ehile. I'm going to unmute you now um, so that you can ask your question. And if other people have questions, please feel free to put your hands up. Prof. Healy, you should be able to speak now. Uh, okay, good, good morning, everybody. Morning. I just joined the, the meeting. Uh, so I don't know what happened before, but uh, I wish you would have a, a good discussion following the presentation and uh, I will be able to make a closing remark at the end of the session. Do you have a specific question at this stage? Not yet, not yet, okay. please. Great, thank you. So I'm going to mute you again. Um, Andrew, if you could answer the question about your opinion about portfolio of evidence. Sorry, I'm gonna ask you to repeat it for me, please. Good morning, everyone. This is from uh, Linda and Tombi. Zodwa, uh, I hope I pronounced that reasonably correctly, sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. With regards to summative assessment, we are currently exploring use of portfolio of evidence uh, as summative means to assess learning. What is your opinion on the use of this method and for what purpose? Okay, very nice. And um, the idea of a portfolio of evidence, uh, I'm gonna advocate for more of this uh, in my later section of this uh, webinar. Um, you're moving into a, 
a, a digital environment and portfolios work so well in this type of environment. The idea then is that when you set assignments and they create digital artifacts, then they, they can put them into their portfolio or their e-portfolio. By the time they get to the end of your course, they have actually built together um, not just a mock that you would normally get from an exam saying that they are proficient. You have evidence that they really can do the work. And the nice thing about these e-portfolios is that you can then allow the student to send the prospective employer the hyperlink so that they can go into the portfolio and see the evidence. So this gets away from that, uh, uh, that gap between what your certificate says and what you can actually do. So I would strongly endorse that you guys start thinking about um, setting up e-portfolios of evidence. I think it's a great idea and it's vastly superior than just sitting in an exam at the end. Nice, I like that. Anything, are there any other questions? Uh, ooh. That's it for now. All right. So we'll push on. So anyone who does, um, say it like this, um, often if you, if you are going to go for like a portfolio approach to the way that you do assessment and therefore your summative assessment really is the grading of this portfolio rather than an examination, for example, then each of the tasks that you set during the ERT sessions is very important. Those tasks could be building blocks towards <clears throat> um, an, an effective portfolio. Um, <clears throat> the, so therefore, when you are, e e even when you are teaching, the idea then is everything should be considered. And even we could even do tests during the um, sessions which are not summative but maybe formative which allows you a lot more leeway in how you set them because they're not trying to be punitive in any way what they're really trying to do these formative assessments is be teaching aids and learning aids towards developing whatever the skill set is or the uh, the, the knowledge uh, that, that is required. So for number two, we want to say, how can you exploit digital diagnostic and formative assessment tools, which you could then, um, on the one hand, use to gauge if learning is happening, and two, have evidence that they are growing, and if, if possible, even put them in a, in a portfolio. So let's have a look what we've got here. So assessment, I would now argue, is actually crucial during ERT some type of um, diagnostic testing, for example, could be done up front. Uh, we want to know, are, do, especially if our students have come from different backgrounds, are we all on the same stage? Uh, do we all have the same background knowledge? Do we all have similar prior experiences before we embark on this journey, which is your course? So diagnostic testing then will allow us to see that are we all in the same place before we start. And then you could use diagnostic testing again later when you say, well, are we all more or less at the right place now that we have progressed down this journey, down this learning pathway? And um, it's, whenever I go into African universities, it's quite common that you hear the lecturer say, are you with me? Are you with me? And what they're really saying is, um, are we all at the same place or do we need to um, uh, catch some people up or give some remedial work or extension work or whatever. So diagnostic testing is very important then in terms of uh, understanding where the class is in terms of their learning pathway. Formative assessments, we're going to have a go at it. We're going to have a little um, experiment and see if it works. But formative assessment is really a learning tool. It's a building block. It is um, very different. Uh, some of you, of course, will know this, but I'm just stating the obvious so you can see where I'm coming from. But formative assessment then would be um, an activity as part of your course. And it could be a quiz, but it could be really um, uh, uh, many other things. It could be project work as well. All right, so keep that in mind then. Diagnostic and formative, I would say, really lend themselves well to the digital online environment. And we'll show you some of the tools where 
this uh, is uh, uh, what are available and a lot of them are free or have a free program one of the basic uh, uh, programs for you um, summative assessment mm, okay yes but I've given it an amber tick because I'm thinking we if we're thinking of like an examination which is normally invigilated um, and all them, then it can do it, but it's not going to be great. And in the webinar one, a number of people raised the problem of how do we know that the person at the end of the com of the of the internet is the right student and so on. So there are many many security issues that need to be thought through very carefully for summative assessment. So maybe we should try and get away from the examination uh, formula, which is not very effective anyway in terms of monitoring real learning and the acquisition of real skills. But uh, we'll come to that a little bit later. So I've written there as a, at the bottom, at least not the way we do it normally. So I'd say that's why I've put it in amber. And then another uh, uh, set of um, activities and assessment, which are also a little bit more difficult online, is subjects that use equations or specific skill sets. And it's not like you can't do it, but you need to get yourself organized. And I'm thinking very simply of mathematics here. So um, uh, if many of the LMSs and these online platforms haven't really structured themselves properly yet to embrace equations properly. So, and I'll show you a few tricks around this problem, but um, uh, it is a well-known problem now. And more and more of these platforms are beginning to provide some type of equation editor into the testing environment. So uh, we'll have a look at that uh, in, also. So keep those in mind then. Diagnostic, yay. Formative, cool. Summative, mm. -hmm. And those subjects that require specialized writing or specialized skills, mm, we have to think more deeply about how to do that. All right. So. Um, Here's just a, a way of saying what I've just said diagrammatically. So there's our learning bubble in the middle, and there's our diagnostic <coughs> testing, which is often done before learning starts. Then we move on to formative testing that can happen during the learning process, and it says the assessment for learning. Okay. Uh, then it jumps across to summative and um, assessment after learning and then back to diagnostic. So for diagnostic and for formative, you can do it in multiple different ways. There are so many different little platforms that you can play with. I've put up a few there. Socrative, I've mentioned, uh, also to help you with some uh, diagnostic. Uh, there's an example with a link to UROC. It's very cool, uh, obviously aimed at kids. Um, uh, but it, it provides them with a template to fill in and then uh, generates some advice about how they should proceed with their learning. Um, so those would be like diagnostic tools. I've put Moodle there as well because you can definitely use the quiz facilities within Moodle or any LMS to do diagnostic testing. Formative, we're going to muck around with those two today. We're going to have a look at uh, Kahoot in a moment and we're also going to uh, I've given you some tutorials for quizzes so you can have fun with your formative assessment summative assessment I'm going to unpack a little bit more uh, carefully towards the end of the webinar um, but there are the the the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the LMS is I'm familiar with and you probably want to do your summative assessment with inside uh, LMS because of the enhanced security features so any LMS would probably have to be linked into the way that you do summative. And I'm going to thank GCRISP01, who did the diagram and uh, nice little OER that I was able to incorporate. All right. So um, Andrew, in the web, yes. Let's uh, just take a quick pause there. Cool. Um, just a couple of comments on the chat that I think you can address to uh, possibly quickly. Um, First one, just a, 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 some more observation about portfolios. Due to the crisis mode, I think portfolios will take too long for the current intervention. Portfolios also need self-assessment by the students and they may not be prepared for this. Uh, and that comes from Kiran Odav. And then Unity Chapunza says, summative assessment is still a challenge in formal ERT, especially as we've been 
traditionally used to invigilation, uh, end of, invigilated end of semester examinations. For courses that are designed to use formative or continuous assessment, uh, these are easier to transform, especially with the use of e-portfolios of evidence. So those are just some observations. Nice. Two, two mm. quick comments or questions. In your opinion, what is the best free lockdown browser, which is easy to use by the lecturers and students available? I'm looking for something that will not affect data and bandwidth too much. And then uh, another question, how do we effectively assess the impact of e-learning on students if we still have challenges with security? So just some questions for you there. All right. Uh, the browser, uh, I'll be honest, I'm one of the few people who actually use Microsoft Edge. Um, uh, there's not very popular browser, um, but it's been stripped down and it now uh, runs very simply. Uh, everything is laid out very neatly. Um, but I would say any of the big, the, the big three, uh, um, Chrome, for example, I think is, is very good. And if you're going to work in a Google Classroom environment, uh, it's really been built for Chrome. So that's cool. Um, and then the other one I tend to use from time to time is uh, Firefox. I still like Firefox. Um, I tend to use those three interchangeably, although I'm one of the weird people who use Edge. Um, I don't think it's really that serious. I think it's the browser itself uh, is pretty generic. I would say it's the way that you design your, your ERT materials as to whether they're going to be heavy in terms of bandwidth and so on. So um, you might remember in webinar one, we went through, if, you're, if your students are situated in a low tech environment, then your materials need to be organized and your, uh, so that they are not heavy. They're not, they're not like video, which is very bandwidth um, intensive, but rather stripped down to work better in low connectivity environments. And then we also mentioned in that webinar that your tools also Sorry, should be- Sorry, Andrew. Yes? Uh, yeah. I, I made a mistake in the way I interpreted it. Uh, the, the question was actually about a lockdown browser. In other words, a secure browser to be used in assessments, not on browsers generally. Oh, right. You know, okay. Secure from the, so I, I was thinking lockdown in our current uh, COVID-19 environment, not in terms of assessment. Sorry. Apologies for my misunderstanding. Okay. And then all I can do is just endorse what I said uh, earlier. If, there, if it is a case where the marks are going to be used for some type of summative assessment, then you've got to get them behind the LMS uh, wall, number one. And even then, it's not guaranteed that your security would be would be ideal. Um, the the LMSs um, uh, do have some security features. For example, they won't allow you can make a setting where they won't allow additional windows to open, which means they can't go and do Google searches to answer your question. Um, they do also um, put a if you. If the students are in an invigilation environment, it does put a photograph of the student up so that the invigilator can check that the right person is sitting at the machine. And there are, um, you'll see later, I've put some biometric um, articles. More and more institutions now are beginning to use biometric uh, gateways into the assessment and so on. But I would say that if you are in ERT and you are now wanting to do some type of summative assessment, you've got to change the way you would do it. I'll, I'll come to it later, but basically an exam format just won't work. Okay, you, I would say rather go for um, some, um, some term papers or some environment where they give them time, let it be open book, uh, try and get rid of that type of, of uh, security risk where um, you would know uh, based on their prior work, whether it's in line with what they've done before. So again, summative assessment, big question mark. I would try not to do it during ERT if you won't change the way that you want to do your assessment. Okay, so that's my, my spin on that. Uh, any other questions? That's it for now. Cool. All right, so we're still, I'm just trying to show you an example here. Here's UCT. Again, they've released their little manual for, for teachers, uh, for lecturers uh, uh, during ERT, and they've shared it with that little license at the bottom. So this is an example of how UCT are advising their lecturers. 
So for example, they say, if your assessment will be multiple choice questions or short answers, then here are some little guides and uh, it says, uh, notice that these type of tests minimize your marking burden, but do require you to uh, do some work up front. Um, you have to prep it properly. Multiple choice questions can be used to provide quick feedback, but require time to write. Okay, so that's ERT that kind of works nicely, but it does need prep. If it's a demonstration and verbal presentations, then that the UCT is encouraging uh, lecturers to get the students to video what they're doing to, as an example that they can do the skill or um, can perform uh, or are proficient at whatever it is that they need. So they're saying the students can use their phones and can submit these attach, attachments to their learner management system. Long answers such as essays, reports, um, projects, they would strongly advise it's done in a learner management environment and they were telling their lecturers that they must use an anti-plagiarism tool called Turnitin to check that it isn't just been downloaded from somewhere on the internet. Where there's calculations, uh, we we're talking about equations earlier, then if they have to do uh, calculations and use equations and so on, then the, uh, uh, maybe they need to show the working. So how did they derive that answer and they need to show the, the workings, then the students should do it on something that they can photograph. Okay, so um, perhaps on a piece of paper and then submit the photograph. So you can see here, even at UCT, they're now saying we've got to think out of the box in terms of how we would do what we did previously in assessment and that then submit drawings and graphics, students to convert to a PDF and submit uh, to the LMS. Okay, so um, yes, we've got to rethink about how we've done things. Are there any questions? before I experiment with you guys. Right, so um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, incidentally, I have one observation from a person from UCT who says they caution the use of videos because it may disadvantage students with limited access to data, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is an important consideration. Two questions. Uh, from in a tembu for you, Andrew. Number one, how can the effective use of curation benefit our teaching and learning? And two, are there AI tools that can be used to measure the performance of an individual action, interaction with a user interface? Uh, those are quite complex questions, so you may not be able to get to them in, in entirety. Um, so, uh, and then if anyone would like to raise, to raise a hand to ask any questions or make any comments, uh, if you can keep them brief, I don't have any at the moment. So back to you, Andrew. Oh, hang All on. right. Uh, now, I, let sorry. Me just, uh, Andy, let me just take this. Uh, this is uh, in and Tembu who posed that question. So I'm going to just uh, unmute them very quickly. All right, please go ahead. Oh, thank you, Neil. Andrew? Yes. Yes. Um, I posed those two questions. Good morning, and thank you for quite a good presentation so far that you're currently giving us. I pose those two questions based on um, some of the five e-learning trends that are currently uh, making a way in terms of the use of LMSs. So one thing that I was looking into was the, the, um, the personalized learning or the adaptive learning for students. So then I was asking the question, are there any AI tools that one can look into that can help and assist or that can assist in trying to measure the student performance individually, not by looking at the activity completion uh, tracking uh, tool that we have on LMS? Um, I personally can't endorse any of the AI tools that are being uh, that are they're coming to the fore at the moment. I've had no yeah. real experience with them. There's no doubting there's a wave of new developments coming through. So I think within the short to medium term, uh, we will see these AI tools uh, become more available. But I, have, I personally have had no experience with them. Uh, I tend to work in environments where we, we have low resources. So we prefer to start with out the box solutions and that currently none of them really have an effective AI uh, component to them. So for this ERT phase, I think we're gonna have to keep it simple, but we need to keep an eye on that. I think it's very exciting 
and potentially daunting uh, in terms of what role AI might bring. Mm, okay. All right. All right. Okay, I'm going to experiment here. I'm going to try and change my screen. What we're going to do is play around with a, one of these formative assessment tools. This one is called Kahoot. And I want to know if the, any learning has taken place from this webinar. So, or the, the, the three webinars. So I've put together a short little revision test and I would like you to do it for me. And then I can monitor in real time um, what you've done. So what's going to happen is I am going to put on the screen questions very similar to the one that you see on the screen at the moment. And you'll notice that there are four options. They are color code coded. So there's a red, a blue, a yellow, and a green. And I would encourage those people who have a second device. So maybe a, a cell phone next to your laptop, you're going to need to keep your zoom open and active. You can't hide it. So you'll need a second device like a cell phone in order to um, participate. You don't all have to, but it would be nice if we have enough people so we can demonstrate what's, what's going on. So um, I would encourage you now to go to kahoot.it and I'm going to put up on the screen the code that I would like you to, to try. All right, here we go. Let's see if I can do this. Um, and you can hear me, people are coming in. So you'll see that there is a code 59610047. And on your spare device, like a phone, then you go to kahoot.it. And on the opening, the main screen, it'll ask you for this game pin. So can you put the game pin? At the moment, we've got 22 players in the Okay, so the first question coming up, and you'll see on your, on your device, you need to choose the right color. So which ERT resource option do we not recommend? Can you choose one of the colors? All right. So as a... Uh, a lecturer in my own right, I'm now looking at these scores to see whether what I said in webinar one has actually been uh, simulated. So out of 50 odd people, 30, close to 30 said yes. What we should do when we're selecting our ERT resources is to uh, offer in multiple formats, uh, distribute only essential content and try and chunk the material. So the one that was no good was distribute a comprehensive list. We say don't overwhelm them, you might remember. Okay, so I'm a little bit worried that about 20 odd of you didn't get it. So but let's see if that was just warm up problems. There's our um, scoreboard. And uh, you see that you're able to put in a non de plume or a nickname. So therefore, formative assessment, very unthreatening. It doesn't really matter uh, how far you uh, how far down the list you are. Which strategy fails to add context to ERT lessons? All right. And again, I'm a, as a lecturer, I'm a little worried. Uh, I'm not getting 100% from my webinars, but I'm getting the vast majority of people who are following what we've done in these these webinars. Here's another one. Which strategy encourages students to support each other? Yay! That one didn't pose a problem. So I'm feeling more confident as a lecturer that some of my stuff went through. Here's the fourth one. Which topics are well suited to ERT? Yay! Theoretical topics, you might remember from our second webinar that we mentioned some things just are uh, uh, easily done uh, on uh, during ERT. And yeah, most of you are on speed with that. Which communication strategy requires the smallest amount of connectivity?
Hmm, okay, I might have to rework this one. So maybe I have to do a revision exercise. My class isn't 100% with me. Um, yes, email we mentioned was an example of a low-tech uh, 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 communication strategy. All right, Andrew is still up there. In fact, he's pulling away. Becca and Rocco are uh, in close pursuit. Last one. An open resource means Yay, I feel very good about that one. Obviously, I've said it enough. All right. So an open resource you can use for free and without asking for permission. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what we're trying to encourage you guys to use and to share your own. Okay, nice. All right. That's the end of our um, our Kahoot. Andrew is our winner. Rocco is the silver medal. And Becca takes the third. Okay. We got some runners up. Yay. All right. And um, now, if I want to, I can now go through and just check the full set of results. And I can see uh, if there are people uh, way behind or whatever. I can save the results and have a look another another time. So what we're trying to say here then is this is a free little utility. Um, we had 70 of you doing the Kahoot test uh, using your phones, easy to get in, uh, fun, no threat, um, and it provides me with a little bit of data and it also provides the learner with some thought whether they were up uh, doing well in that particular example. All right, I'm going to go back to my my PowerPoint. Let me share differently. Andrew, while you're doing that, I've got a hand from Temple. Uh, I'll be a fool, eh? So, Temple, I'm going to unmute you now to ask your question. Thank you, um, coordinators. I would really wish to understand the last slide. I didn't get that point. Thank you. The one that's on the screen? Or the one before? The one before this. This one here? Yes. Yes. Thank okay, you. I'll, um, just very quickly, um, I mentioned that uh, certain universities are beginning to put an, an ERT um, uh, set of recommendations in place. So th maybe this is something that you might encourage your university or your institution to uh, start doing. Um, they've re UR the UCT has released this with an open license so we can share it. And I was just, it was showing you what tools are available for the different types of assessments multiple choice, demonstration, long answers, calculations, etc., and then some advice about how to do it. So a very simple mechanism, but the idea then is to try and provide ac uh, support. And here they were saying multiple choice questions are great in terms of providing, uh, 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 relieving you of your marking burden, but it does require some type of investment upfront before it works properly. Uh, we mentioned for demonstration, don't be scared of asking students to submit video as an example, they say, um, especially if it's some type of demonstration or verbal presentation. For long answers, good old essays, reports, and so on will work, but they were encouraging the lecturers to use Turnitin, which is an anti-plagiarism um, uh, uh, app. And calculations, if it's very involved and you want to see the work and you don't want just the answer, they were encouraging the lecturers to collect student photographs of their workings. And then the last one was drawings and pictures. They were asking for it to be saved as a PDF. So all of this slide is really trying to show is to spark an imagination about how we might need to change what we do in assessment to suit this new environment. Is that useful? Yes, thank you. And then uh, someone just quickly asking if uh, Kahoot can be used asynchronously. Uh, yes, it can. So I was doing the team mode because I wanted to do it quickly and I wanted to get as, as many of you on uh, uh, at the time. So that's like the synchronous version. But there is an asynchronous one where you basically give them the code and they can go in and do it at their own time. And then later on, you come along and collect the results. 
Um, the machine obviously marks it because you can see there it was. Um, so yes, there is. And it's available, hmm. No, it is. It's available in the free version of Cahoots. I'm just having a think. Okay. So let's uh, move on then. That's all. The, one more p person asking if you can elaborate on Vula Dropbox. I don't know if you know that tool. Um, so Vula, uh, my understanding is Vula is the name that uh, UCT has given to their LMS. Their LMS is actually made by a company called Sakai, um, but they've given it their own name. Uh, some institutions have done this, for example, VUT, uh, Vol University of Technology, calls their LMS Vutela, even though it's, it's made by Blackboard. So Vula is purely a name that they've come up with. And obviously, uh, Sakai has a Dropbox facility, which looks very similar to the Dropbox app, um, where you can leave resources for other people to come and pick up. And uh, it synchronizes with their devices so they can get it whenever they're ready. Um, yeah, nothing too special there. Okay, so let's keep moving on. And then we've got uh, people starting to share their, their uh, other tools that they've got in the, in the chat. But just to alert you, Andrew, we've also got uh, just uh, under th around 30 minutes to go. Cool. Okay. Um, all right, so let's move on to the third component, which is the diagnostic tools and the tracking facilities. Um, which you should now start to uh, activate within your courses on the LMS. So, um, what a mess. Oops, go back. Sorry. Um, all right, so for um, most LMSs have a course completion tool. I did mention it earlier. Um, and this basically provides you with an overview of how well the class is doing in terms of working through all the resources and the activities. Um, and then there's also the student activity reports, which is very useful if you want to drill down to a specific activity or a specific person to identify how well they are doing. So, um, for example, in Moodle, uh, it provides the lecturer with this type of um, information. Uh, who is the person? Uh, what's their email? And have they completed the various activities within the course. And the lecturer has the ability to identify which pieces of the course it wants tracked. So uh, in this particular course that you're seeing on the screen, there were some pages, there was a forum, there was an assignment that they had to hand in. That last one is an assignment. And it, the uh, little boxes give you an overview of how well your class is doing. So in this case, I can see my most people are nearly finished. There's a couple of outstanding bits and pieces, which I could then chase up and make sure that those people uh, realize that they have not yet been marked as complete or course complete. Um, this does take a bit of setting up. And, um, but once you've done it, it's very handy that you can just look at the class globally and you can see whether they're doing well as a class or whether they, um, are all struggling in terms of getting through the materials and the activities. The little dot, dotted box means it's the machine that marks it. So there's some criteria you have to set so that the machine knows, the platform knows um, whether they can consider that complete or not. If it was a, um, in Moodle, if it's a, um, a solid box, that means the student can tick it themselves. So if they are satisfied that they have completed, then they can tick it themselves. So you've got those two options. Um, if, however, you don't want just a global overview, you want to drill deep down, then this is the advantage of, of the LMS. So you can drill down in terms of um, the activity. So, for example, that picture on the left uh, allows me to see as a activity how well did they do. And that activity happens to be a poll. So they could tell me stuff. I had set a poll and then they were able to tell me where they sat on the, on the, on a level. So in this case here, yeah, I can see that the, uh, the rating is very low. So it's just above one out of five, 1 1.5, 1 1.4 on these things here. So 
I can see, and I can also see how many people have actually responded to this particular activity. So you get that level of statistics, which is very nice. And you can either do it at the class level or the activity level. But you might be worried about a specific individual. And uh, here's Pross. Um, she was on one of my courses. And I've put her up because she's great. And uh, she was very astute and very diligent. And you can, sure enough, you can see from when I asked for a report on how well she had done in terms of engaging with the resources and the activities, you can see she's hit just about everything. Uh, in fact, the one document she really drilled down deep, she tackled it 10 times for some reason. So um, then you can get a, a, like a map of how well the individual is doing in your course in terms of engaging with the stuff. All right, so um, I would say then that you need to get those um, diagnostic tools and the trackers all uh, set up and activated so you can monitor the progress of students through the different um, sections. I've put together some more OERs for you. Oh, the one I'm not sure about, actually, it's that first one. It's a Vimeo file, and I can't find the license for it. Um, but it is quite neat if you are working in Moodle. It'll uh, take you through the steps uh, very simply and very quickly, and I, I like it. So I've stuck it there anyway, but hey, you'll have to view it on Vimeo. It's not an OER. You can't download it. You'll have to check uh, that, um, that you watch it in the, in the proper environment. TED Talks, though, are all OERs. Um, I forget the exact, uh, though there's the license, CC BY. Um, and uh, I've found it using the filter on YouTube. So there's definitely an OER. Uh, you can have a look. Um, uh, Eric Duval talks about open learning and uh, how to um, analyze what's happening. He is a bit of a doer, <laughs> a doer presenter, but what he says is really on point. So I, I endorse his his uh, his values, if not necessarily his presentation skills. But anyway, um, if you're interested in uh, open learning analytics, I can endorse that one. And then we've got another a Moodle Learner Analytics step-by-step -step tutorial. And I thought he that was also very thorough and very good. It's not an OER. That one is standard YouTube license. You can only watch it on YouTube. Uh, you can't do can't download it or anything like that. Okay. Cool. Um, rethinking summative assessment, or let's just see any questions before we move on. Uh, there's one question which I'm not sure if it's connected at this stage quite, but I think it's uh, helpful. If Moodle is the preferred LMS of an institution, and I'm sure this would uh, apply to other LMSs as well, then how can one sync all the other important applications with Moodle? So if you're using these other apps, how would you connect them with Moodle and integrate them? Okay. Um, Certain apps uh, have obviously worked with Moodle. I, I'm going to talk about Moodle because I have a Moodle experience. But as Neil pointed out, um, you, you need to investigate your LMS uh, and to what extent it has built up a relationship between other developers. So in Moodle, for example, there's a whole load of module plugins that you can go through the library and you can identify uh, additional functionality that can then uh, click in or just plug into the Moodle environment and then you get the tools in your Moodle interface. Um, I'm thinking of H5P, which is a, um, an app which allows you to build interactive elements in your LMS um, and that you can just plug it in and then it, it appears in your Moodle uh, tools. Um, but the, the, you'll find that many of the new stuff, especially the new startups, they're not mature enough yet to have got to a point where they have a relationship with the different LMS developers. So you might find that you have to run some of it external to your LMS. It's quite common that you would have to run it in parallel. So for example, Cahoots, I'm not aware that it, it integrates directly into uh, an LMS. So then obviously you don't want to do things like your summative assessment using those type of tools because you can't get your data into your, your learner management system. Um, Moodle does integrate with some of the some enterprise systems. Um, so for example, the, um, the, your uh, enrollment and registration processes, um, which might be done on a different platform, you would have to investigate whether they are uh, 
um, if they, a marriage between them is possible and therefore they can transfer information across from one to the other, it's worth investigating. Again, it's not universal. So you would have to um, check and find out. So yeah, keep that in mind. First prize is if your LMS integrates with these other apps and platforms, but um, be aware that the vast majority don't and you'd have to run them in parallel. All right, let's push on. Um, sorry, Andrew, just quickly. What yeah. professional advice do you give for an institutional university library to adopt Google Classroom for a start? What are the advantages or disadvantages of the LMS over the Google Classroom? I think maybe that was a question that we covered in a previous webinar. So uh, we can refer that user back to uh, the early webinar recordings. Yeah, yes. Um, we basically said, uh, your institutional LMS sh should be king because it's well, it should be well looked after and there is proper security on it and so on. So rather if you can use your institutional LMS, Google Classroom is great. If you want a free personal uh, version, I wouldn't put all my institutional stuff in a Google Classroom uh, on the personal account. There is a school account, you might remember. So um, maybe investigate a college account on Google Classroom if you want to go that route. Okay, let's move on. All right. And which brings me to the, um, the next item and uh, our final uh, item, which is um, rethinking summative assessment. It's come up often and um, it is potentially a barrier for many of you thinking, oh, we can't do the exams the way we've normally done them and so on. And I'm afraid that is the truth. Um, Security is improving, but it is still problematic for uh, proper remote assessment. So if this is important, if these marks are important, if they are term grades or they are exit exams or anything like that, then you might uh, think about holding this over till later when you have more control and more security. I did mention Moodle and various other LMSs do have security features. Um, and they are improving. And um, you'll see just now there are some examples where biometrics are being integrated into these uh, LMSs, but it's still not default for these uh, LMSs. Um, so security is improving, but still problematic. But I mean, it's problematic anyway. Um, in Nigeria, for example, uh, I, I came across these people who are professional exam takers, they charge a fee and then they, they sit in normal uh, examination venues. Uh, they have the um, person's code and then they sit there and the vigilator doesn't know who they are anyway. So they sit and write the paper on, on behalf of someone else. So it already is a problem in exams anyway. And obviously there are uh, more um, uh, problems in terms of remote learning if you're using uh, uh, computers. So yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, elements tools to support assessment. I have mentioned that there are little things that can be done. For example, you can uh, say that while they're doing the exam in the LMS, they can't open other browser windows. But there's always a ways around that. You can always use your phone, for example. So um, the, the, if, if you are setting exams whereby they can get the answer from doing a Google search, it's not a very good exam. Uh, let's face it, if it's pure recall and pure comprehension, then you're wasting everyone's time. You should rather be setting them questions whereby access to resources, if they need them, you, they can have their textbooks open. It should be uh, at a much higher level for, uh, for most of us in terms of the subjects we teach. So yeah, um, there are some LMS tools to support the assessment, but yeah, I don't think it's, it's, it's good enough for an exit exam, for example. Uh, aim for authentic assessment. I would say we now need to move away from the way that we've been doing assessment in the past. This exit exam idea is also a bit of a disaster that it all rests on this one writing of one paper or uh, that's the worst case scenario anyway. And I think we should rather aim for authentic assessment. So it can still be summative, but it needs to be 
authentic. It means not so much just comprehending the information that we've gone through in the, uh, in the course, but the ability to apply it into new contexts. So um, the idea then is the assessment task should align with what you are trying to achieve in the course. So if, for example, you're trying to create accountants, CAs, chartered accountants, then um, it's not so much about the protocols of doing chartered accountancy. It's more about how they would sift through a, uh, a set of data which they have never seen before and apply those principles in terms of doing some type of an audit or preparing for an audit or whatever. So the idea then is we've got to get away from testing just simple principles and we've got to get to a situation where our people are applying knowledge and skill sets and so on in an authentic way. <clears throat> I put a little picture of Africa there because I thought we of all people have special problems and special challenges and we should obviously be setting the exams which will kind of contextualize what we're teaching them uh, for working and being effective within our particular circumstances here in Africa. All right, so I would say then one of the things we need to do is change the way that our assessments are done so that we are more in line with authentic assessment. And uh, one, of the <clears throat> uh, one of the people at the beginning mentioned e-portfolios. You can see I endorsed the idea. We've already talked about that, but I would say again, that would be a much better way to um, provide someone with um, uh, exit is by letting them compile a portfolio of evidence that they can do the doing and um, have done it already. So not just uh, a theoretical or an, ex or a, an exam. Um, I've pinched, oh, no, I haven't pinched, I've, I've um, acknowledged uh, the Pasadena City College. Um, they put together this little graphic and I think here you can see um, they've tried to also identify how authentic assessment is vastly superior to our traditional assessment and spe specifically exams and so on. We've got to get away from remembering and basic comprehension and we've got to move towards these other skill sets. If you know your Bloom's taxonomy, you can see that these are all higher, um, higher order thinking skills. We, we need them to show us evidence that they can evaluate, that they can apply. Um, and that they can create. Those are some of the the, the, edu uh, the verbs uh, used uh, in the in the graphic. So yes, I, I would say if ERT is continuing, then we got to um, start thinking about how we can move away from the traditional examination towards some type of authentic assessment, maybe with portfolios, uh, what, but at least with some type of an activity whereby we see them doing these higher order thinking skills. Um, here is, again, another little basket. Andrew, I've got a hand here. Um, yeah, let's do a question. So, uh, Kiran, you are unmuted now. Oh, I wanted to know about videos and uh, because our institution says that it's so expensive, is there a way around that? Uh, okay. I've been collecting videos and I've been wanting to. And then the second, sorry, the second thing is with regard to. Uh, um, um, it slipped my mind. I'll, I'll, I'll ask it again later. All right. So, the video question we have raised this flag a few times. The problem with video, of course, is that it is bandwidth intensive. Um, these videos aren't small uh, relative to, say, email, for example, and therefore the cost tends to be passed on to the user, so the student. And obviously students have limited resources. So that is part of the quandary is these guys are having to pay extra for their, for their um, resources if they are in the video format. Video has many advantages over, over other resources, but that's one of the drawbacks. Is there a way around this problem? Well, what you could do is put them on your learner management system and then get your learner management system zero rated. We raised this issue of zero rating previously uh, in one of the other webinars, but the idea then is that it's the institution which carries the burden of traffic onto that LMS, not the user. Um, the service provider um, would, 
uh, would have to be negotiated with so that the institution and the service provider have this relationship uh, and then the server gets zero rated. So that's one way around that. Or you could go much low tech than that. You could supply the um, videos on a USB stick. And then at, when they go off to do their ERT, um, then they take their stick with them. And then you can say in your course when they must look at which video. So that way they don't have to stream the video and therefore it is considerably cheaper for them. Um, and then you've got the, the power of that. But that requires some thinking up, up ahead. And we're now deep in the middle of ERT. So how they would collect the little USB sticks would need to be thought through carefully. Um, yeah, so there are ways around it. Um, and I am a fan of video. I find that's how I learn these days is I want to know how something's done. Then I get on YouTube and Vimeo and, and find out who's done it before me. So yeah, get creative. Can you think of the other half of your question? Let's keep moving on, Andrew. Uh, we've All only right. got about 10 minutes or so until we need to wrap up. Um, okay. And some people already need to move on. All right. Three little um, open access journals for you here, little articles. One is on using the fingerprint scanner during the assessments. Some people are experimenting but with it. Andrew, I think we, I, we are now viewing your Zoom screen, not your slides. Yeah. Okay. But hang on, sorry. Is that right? That's fine, we're back, sorry, that's my mistake, sorry. Okay, okay. I'm a bit worried because <laughs> I've been here for a while. Okay. Turn that off. So that's all good. All right, sorry, now I um, can't see my screen. Oh, there we go. Sorry, hang on. There we go. All right, three, uh, very quickly, three articles you might want to uh, read on. One is using a fingerprint scanner during the assessment. Another one is on how to address cheating in e-assessment. Uh, and the third one is how to optimize your LMS. In this case, it is Moodle for quizzes and online assessments. So there's some open access journals that you might want to read up uh, on those. All right. Um, I was hoping that when you saw the cahoots, you went, oh, um, that's easy and fun and lighthearted and a good example of formative assessment. Um, maybe I could do that. But I have done this in face-to-face -face sessions in other uh, uh, university workshops. And a lot of people say, it's a bit juvenile, the coloring and the, the fonts and so on. Is there a more s serious um, interface? And um, so, yes, there is. So this one is not cahoots. This one's called quizzes. And it is much more uh, muted in terms of its, uh, its styling. So um, the idea then, I was going to uh, go through some of these um, videos, but I think uh, I would rather ask you to come and take the presentation and then work through it yourself. Um, the idea was we were going to demonstrate how to set up your quizzes account how to um, set your questions, how to get your students in. And um, the interesting thing, how this is different is with Cahoots, I was controlling the pace. So I would wait till I thought everyone was ready and then we would go on to the next question. But with quizzes, it's a race to the end. So they get extra points for being quick and they don't have to wait for the whole class. They can just work through the set of 10 questions, for example, and um, uh, in their own time. So yes, uh, if you want to have a little bit more serious quiz, but still in a very similar format, then I would say have a look at this video here. It's in the it's in the presentation, and um, it's also good fun. All right, um, I'm not going to show it today. Um, and this brings me to the end of my my formal presentation. Um, I. I'm going to sum up in a minute, but are there any questions at this point before we start summing up and handing back to the AAU, to Violet? So we have uh, quite a lot of active chat. 
Um, at the moment, no raised hands for questions. So, uh, oh, there we go. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Felix. Felix, I'm unmuting you if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay. My question is in two ways. First, I would like to ask on the originality test of student submission during um, ERT sessions. How do faculty really ascertain the responses of students to assignments to questions? Googled from um, Wikipedia or whatever resources they use. So how do you really check up student feedback when it comes to originality? Because um, we, do we have NMS platforms that could incorporate on um, student um, feedback checkup? Number two, um, my concern is on assessment. When we're moving from um, traditional exams to online assessment, how do you check up um, the um, participant or student's um, um, real real-time assessment. What I mean by real-time assessment, when students um, aren't the one writing the exam, or maybe it's um, um, a, a proxy or what other method. So what are we thinking through in ERT towards um, migrating from traditional to online, as well as still keeping um, security issues, uh, maybe through proctoring, or what other methods would be useful for us to actually say oh, a student A, Either about biometrics or fingerprints or what have you, is actually writing this design at this point in time. How do we combine such um, resources together? Those are the two questions. Student in a forum discussion, for example, hasn't just been copy and pasted from Wikipedia or from some other reference online. And the um, that's a good question. And I would, what I used to do in the early days before I had access to these anti plagiarism apps and so on was just to use Google back at them. So if I read something and I went, hmm, that just doesn't sound like this person, it's, it's using um, a language which doesn't seem quite right, then I would just copy a couple of sentences and stick them in, in Google and then just have a quick check. And then that way it would show me anything that's exactly the same or very similar. So um, you don't have to go for these fancy, fancy um, anti-plagiarism apps if you are on a budget. Um, you can just use the power of Google. Um, but it does require you to have to be astute and to have a feel for your class. Um, if they're all anonymous people in your mind, then that's much harder, of course, to pick out um, uh, something I, I must say the one time uh, I read this article put together by one of my students and I thought oh shucks I know he's good but this is really good and I was reading 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 I thought oh this guy he's he's even higher in my estimation than previous and then right at the end it said click here for more information and I realized that he had just copied and pasted it from somewhere and hadn't even checked it and stuck it in his assignment so uh, yeah uh, if I had Googled even part of it, then it would have come up and shown me where he got it from. So, um, be, yes, be careful. It is very easy to plagiarize uh, in a digital environment, but there are tools to help you get around that. And I would say your, your institution should th think, think about getting a subscription to one of these anti-plagiarism packages, um, at least for your uh, uh, important stuff like your term marks and maybe some exit exams and so on where you can just check if they've done it if they've had to write this exam digitally that there's a quick check to see that there isn't bulk big chunks of this out there elsewhere and then you said your second part of your question was about um, how can you um, get around security problems for real-time assessment and, I, and again I have to in reiterate what I've said previously and that is very very difficult um, uh, I would say try and break away from real-time assessment if your learners are remote um, because you don't know what's going on on the other end of the uh, the, the link um, rather and it's uh, and if it is a real-time synchronous exam for example then it's going to be quite generic again. We're falling back to that old 
idea that uh, in one sitting you can get them to uh, show how they comprehend something and that's enough and i'm thinking that most of your subjects require these people to become professionals to be able to work in a in a professional environment within a specific context especially an african context and therefore i would say we should really go for assessment which is asynchronous and can be built up over time so again some type of a portfolio of evidence that they have um put together the building blocks so i would say while you're in ert try and steer away from real-time assessment and rather go for some type of asynchronous assessment which is authentic in nature and that provides the multiple opportunities to to demonstrate and to build up evidence that they have the proficiencies so yeah no easy answer for that second half okay thank you very much andrew we've got uh Maybe just time for one very last question from the, the feed. Um, but I think this is also something that segues into the next uh, session, which is how can learning through small groups be enhanced in ERT? Uh, for those of you who haven't been here the whole time, ERT means emergency remote teaching, which is distinguished from online learning in that it's when you had to unexpectedly move your face-to-face -face classes into an online environment because the campus was forced to shut down. Uh, in this case, obviously because of the coronavirus pandemic, but in other cases it may be because of unrest or student protests or for a number of different reasons. Um, so Andrew, if you can maybe uh, just signal to us ahead of next the next session, which is about communication with students, a very quick answer to that before we wrap up as we are now out of time. Sure. All right, I'm going to wrap up then. Um, so what did we cover today? We said that to monitor learning during campus closure, you need to get yourself organized, that uh, you, you should try and use those activities on the LMS that do provide you with some type of a feedback. Okay, so it's not just a mark, but uh, you can actually um, see what's going on. We said that you try and exploit digital diagnostic and formative assessment tools. So you can see um, assessment then, um, has been quite effective uh, for formative and diagnostic um, uh, testing during ERT, uh, but we were trying to warn you to um, not see if you can reorganize your schedule so that during ERT you don't have to do too much summative assessment, which is thought with issues for new users. Um, LMS diagnostic tools and tracking. We say that if you are in an LMS, you have these additional tools, which allows you to track what people are doing and how far they have proceeded through your materials and with your activities. And we said you could do this either at the class level or at the activity level, or even at the individual level. That's the beauty of the LMS. And then we said that uh, finally, when you come to summative assessment for EERT, yeah, you got to be very organized. You got to know what you're doing. We're trying to keep you away from doing real time to, to try and emulate an exam condition because there are issues involved. And we don't even think that that type of assessment an examination, a one-off exam is ideal anyway. We encouraged you to think about authentic assessment and to rather build up a portfolio of evidence. So there you go. And um, finally, we, there's, um, there were two little tools we try to show you today, the cahoots and the quizzes. So if you're feeling adventurous, they're very easy to use. They both offer a free uh, platform that you can experiment with. And yeah, they're good fun. All right, and that is my contribution for today. If you would like to see the, um, the resources, they're all laid out in the Google Classroom. Uh, there are still spaces available in there. I'm not sure why some can get in and others not. I would encourage you to use your Gmail account to get in, if maybe that's it. But if you can't get into the classroom, don't panic. We have everything up on the OER Africa website on that link. And then uh, later today and tomorrow, you will give you the recording of this webinar as well, if you want to go back and view. All right. Um, All right good. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, to, uh, I hope you've all found that useful today. Again, uh, as always, the uh, links to the slides will be uploaded to the OER Africa website and shared by email tomorrow. 
I'll also try and share the chat because there's been so many useful tips and ideas coming through that. Um, and just to close up very briefly, uh, from the AAU side, we have Prof Ehile who will um, wrap things up for us. Okay. Thank you. Can you get me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. I would like to first of all thank uh, Professor Andrew Moore for his insightful presentation. Also, I would like to extend a big thank you to each of the participants that attended today's webinar, focusing on how to know if learning is going on during the lockdowns. From the Association of African Universities perspective, such capacity building programs are very important and relevant for keeping our stakeholders informed and engaged. We have now come to an era where online education has become a necessity and the training of teachers and higher education leaders has also, also uh, become uh, a must. Uh, AU is also grateful for the partnership with OER Africa and particularly the emphasis on open education, educational resources to improve teaching and learning. I invite you to check the AAU website and blog for more information concerning AAU's activities. I wish you all safety during this COVID crisis. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Prof. Hile, and thank you very much, everyone. Um, I will be shutting the webinar down now. So remember that the next session is on Friday. We will see you then. We'll be sharing the links as always. Thank you. Thank you.